Well, good evening. Glad that you are here tonight and uh, grateful for so many that have come to um, be revived with us. We're really thankful that Paul Ponshot and his wife Rhonda and their family could be with us and uh, know that you'll be encouraged this evening and the rest of the week with what he has to share, as well as Chris Malpas. Chris Malpas is joining us all week as well to lead us in singing and share in some uh, musical encouragement for us, and we're grateful for Chris and look forward to hearing that that tonight. If you have not had the chance for Lord's Supper today and you'd like to partake tonight, uh, at the table at the back of the auditorium, if you've not gotten them yet, there are packets available for you to take the Lord's Supper, and Keith Hoddle will be coming up shortly to lead us in a meditation. Just have a couple uh, notes for you all to share those here uh, with you. As we announced this morning, Mary Ridgway passed away this weekend. Her calling hours will be Tuesday from 5 to 8 at the Fisher Funeral Home. And then they're just having a graveside service for the funeral on Wednesday at 11. And that'll be at the Workman Cemetery. Again, that's Mary Ridgeway, so let's keep her family in our prayers, please. And then a note from Ernie Kaufman. Thank you for the cards and prayers at the passing of my sister. And thank you to all who came to the calling hours. It was, uh, it was really, it really made an impression on his family. So uh, Ernie says, thank you and God bless you to all of you. So again, we're grateful that you're here tonight with us. I'll have our prayer. Keith Hotto will make his way up here to the stage and we'll have our meditation following the prayer. Father God in heaven, we give you thanks that we can be together. We're so grateful for each one that has come tonight. And Lord, we ask that you will uh, guide us in all that we hear and learn tonight that our hearts and our minds will be focused on Jesus Christ, on the work of the kingdom, and the opportunity, Lord, that we have to serve you. We're so grateful that uh, Paul and Rhonda can be with us and just pray your blessing on them while they're here. We're so thankful for Chris uh, as well and ask that you'll bless him in his ministry to us this week. And uh, Father, we're grateful for each one that's gathered here from the different congregations that are represented, uh, those from the community and from our own church. And God, we just pray that through all of this, you'll be glorified. We continue to lift up the Mary Ridgeway family to you and ask your blessing on them this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Life is busy. We're often committed to too much and distracted, which causes us to neglect what's important. And we can become discouraged and confused with the daily news. These wearies are something that many of us deal with regularly. In one sense, this is normal. Jesus said we will be weary, and in this world, we will have troubles. Peter said we will have burdens and anxieties to carry. But Peter also tells us to cast those burdens and anxieties on God because he cares for us and will carry them for us. Jesus assures us that though in this world we have troubles, our peace is found in him. Jesus invites us to come find rest by resting in him. Listen to these words in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, upon, my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we come to the Lord's Supper, we're coming to find rest where we are served rather than serving. Though we approach food and meals with a fast food mentality, the Lord's Supper forces us to take a seat with others and rest and pause 
and take notice of what's set before us. When we set our minds on Jesus and his broken body and spilled blood for our sin, our souls are restored by what we have in Christ. Though our sins are many, and though we might walk in here beat up and feeling like a failure, Jesus purchased through death his complete forgiveness and full cleansing. Not only is every sin paid, but the ground of our standing before God and knowing we are loved by God is based on Jesus alone, not how good or how bad we were this week. Despite our sin in Jesus, there is rest because we are forgiven and freed. Communion is not a message about what we need to do, but about what has been done for us. It's not a message about our ability to solve problems, but God's ability and kindness to solve them for us. The gospel then frees us from carrying the weight of the world and the weight of our spiritual walk on our shoulders because God is taking care of us, providing for us, and at work for us. Rest in him today. So as we focus on Christ with that message and through the, the emblems, uh, that were provided for you in the back. Uh, let's, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for everything you've blessed us with, just the, uh, the beautiful end of summer, fall, uh, the ability to rest and uh, find comfort in you, uh, a time to get revived, um, hear some good preaching, and, uh, but most of all, just focus on Christ and uh, let you take care of all our worries because that's what we're celebrating right now is, is what Christ has done for us. So we thank you for uh, these emblems uh, as a weekly reminder, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. It is good to be with you tonight, and I have one request. As we're singing, as I'm singing this song, when you hear me ask... Would you please say amen? Are you glad to be here tonight? Amen. Are you glad that Jesus is the Savior of our life? Amen. Let's, let's worship the Lord. You are not alone If you are lonely When you feel afraid You're not the only we are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and free it's all you've got to lean on but thank god it's all you need and all the people said amen oh and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends and all the people said amen if you're rich or poor hell it don't matter weak or strong you know love is what we're after we're all broken but we're all in this together god knows we stumble and fall and he so loved the world he sent his son to save us all and all the people said amen oh and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends and all the people said amen blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart Blessed are the persecuted and the pure of heart. Blessed all the people longing for another start. For this is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never and all the people said amen whoa and all the people said amen whoa and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends and all the people said amen Ooh. and all the people said amen
this week, our goal is to give glory to God. Amen? It's not about us. It's all about Him. It started when that baby came so many years ago. Fear not, fear not, the angel said, Behold the Messiah's come, the one on whom you've read. And as they spoke to men that day, the heavenly hosts around the throne joined in to say, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Heavenly angels announce his arrival in a little town of Bethlehem. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing holy, he has come to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory, hallelujah to the Lord, amen. Amen. Offering their praise to God's anointed one. And as they spoke, their heart felt love. This glorious sound was on my ear from up above. Well, glory to God, the highest peace on earth, goodwill to men. Heavenly angels announce his arrival in a little town of Bethlehem. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing holy. He has come to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory. Hallelujah. Heavenly angels announce his arrival in a little town of Bethlehem. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing holy. He has come to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory. Hallelujah to the Lord, amen. Hallelujah to the Lord, sing glory. He has come to save the world from sin. Glory to God in the highest glory. Glory, glory to God in the highest glory. Hallelujah to the Lord, amen. Amen, amen. Well, I'm sure you would agree with me that this year is going to go down in the years of all years of our life as a, um, I'm going to be nice. It's been interesting, has it not? It has been interesting, and uh, no way would we have ever been able to anticipate uh, what 2020 has been like. But I'm here to tell you that through it all, I have seen God's faithfulness. How about you? I have seen that God is at work, and I have seen that we know that he is faithful, that the world may be on fire, and it seems like everyone is just out of control, but we know that God is faithful. And I started singing this song several years ago, but uh, it has certainly taken on a whole new meaning now because I'm here to say I have so many things to thank him for. Amen. Got some groceries in the cabinet, got a little gas in the car, got a place to lay my head, and a wife who holds my heart. Got this job I'm kind of liking, keeps the wolf outside my door. I've got so many things to thank him for. I've got a dad who fed the family, and a mom who raised us right. I've got a preacher who's been faithful to shine that gospel light. Got some friends to keep me honest. How could I ask for more? I've got so many things to thank him for. I'm not saying life is perfect. No one gets an easy ride. But through the best and worst, I will bless the Lord. I find his goodness overflowing every moment of my life. I've got so many things to thank him for. me that the 
this world can't take away. I've got a future shining brighter than the darkness of these days. My past has been forgiven, and he remembers it no more. I've got so many things to thank him for. Well, I'm not saying life is perfect. No one gets an easy ride. But through the best and worst, I will bless the Lord. Find his goodness overflowing every moment of my life. I've got so many things to thank him for. I find his goodness overflowing every moment of my life. I've got so many things to thank him for. I've got so many things, so many things. I've got so many things to thank him for. I've got so so many things to thank him for. I've got so many things to thank him for. command and the singer drew his breath the melody rose and dawned on the land and pierced the emptiness and from a barren and lonely place life began to spring as on the stage of time and space god threw back his head and began to sing let there be light Invade the darkness, fill up the void, replace the noise with sweet harmony, and let there be joy, and echoes of laughter, and the singer sings on and still writes the song of a redeemed. Lo, beautifully sung the song when unheard darkness returned again but god had a plan in the second verse to bring back the hearts of man a star in the sky that night in bethlehem and as the baby jesus cried god sang out his song and the angels joined in Let there be joy and echoes of laughter and the singer sings on and still writes the song of a queen that blessed coming
it's your turn now. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a couple songs that I hope you know. Please feel free to sing along. Stand if you can. I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over. to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord O oh my soul oh Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. And on that day 
when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. be like it's never before for the Lord. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, we really appreciate you being with us this week. Chris and his wife and their two sons live down near Centerburg, and uh, he's a farmer. And uh, for years was a minister at the Dover Christian Church. And uh, just last year, uh, trusted in the Lord and went out in the singing ministry. And so he's been a blessing to a lot of churches in our country. And he's preaching next week at the McElroy Road uh, Church in Mansfield, a revival there. Are you singing as well up there too? So uh, you think you ran out of air here. You, you know, that, that's double duty there. There you go. And uh, he has good, good reason to uh, maybe have run out of air on that one song. He did a bike trek with a number of other preachers this past week from Cincinnati to Lake Erie. And uh, they do that every year. And so uh, just glad that you're here with us this week. I'm re really grateful for that. Paul Ponshot, uh, some of you remember Paul when he was just a young man, youth minister down at the Rocky Fork Church of Christ. He's grown up a little bit. And now we can call him Grandpa Paul. And uh, he had a chance to spend some time with uh, Chris and his wife, Grace, and their granddaughter, Susan. Uh, Paul also is the dad of Jillian Ponshot, who's with us as a, a member here at the Millwood Church. And then their daughter, Kayla, is back with Chris this week in Indiana. And um, you, you rode your bike from Cincinnati to Lake Erie. Paul drove from New Jersey to Ohio. And we're glad that you made the journey to be with us. And we're so glad uh, to have you ministering to us this week. And we hope we minister to you as well. So let's pray before Paul comes up. Our God in heaven, we give you thanks. We're so grateful. You are an awesome God. And, and uh, if we could list out 10,000 reasons, Father, we are sure that we could continue beyond even that of why you are such an awesome and great God. Father, we pray that tonight, as we hear the preaching from your word, that our hearts and our minds are transformed, that we seek to take what we hear and live it in our lives. We're grateful for each one that is here tonight and pray that this message in particular will affect the hearts of those who are, are in search of Christ and that we'll do all we can to guide them in the faith. So God bless Paul as he preaches and ministers to us tonight. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
All right, we've had a good day so far and looking to a good uh, evening tonight. Uh, Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 3. We're going to be looking at probably my all-time favorite passage, in my opinion, the most important paragraph in the Bible. While you're turning there, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, and I hope you won't be offended tonight, but I'm going to share a truth with you. You deserve to go to hell, and so do I. Aren't you glad that's not what God wants for us? And that brings us to Romans chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 21. Listen to these great words from the Apostle Paul. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, some of you who know me enjoy getting to talk to uh, Mitch yesterday about some bow hunting. I enjoy doing that. It's this time of year. I like to get my bow out, do a little bit of deer hunting. And in preparation for that, it requires a whole lot of practice. I have a target that I set out in my backyard. I get my bow out and I shoot. And the goal, of course, is to hit the what? The target. But what part of the target? The bullseye. I really enjoy getting to try. The problem is I'm not a very good shot. So I had to eventually get me a crossbow to kind of make up for that. But I still like to shoot that compound bow. And although I'm not a very good shot, there is a sense in that every time I shoot and I miss that bullseye, It's a disappointment. But the good news is I just knock another arrow and try again. And I keep trying and keep trying until I get better and better and better. When we think about spiritual things, when we think about, as we're going to talk about tonight, God's provision of salvation, when we think about our spiritual need, once we miss the bullseye of God's glory, You can't just knock another arrow and try again. You can't just keep trying and trying and trying and hope that you make up for the times that you've missed. Only God can do something to hit that bullseye, and he has done that for you and for me in Christ. So we're going to take a look at this passage of Scripture tonight. And the first thing I want you to see is that there is a righteousness of God that has been manifested. Look at those first couple of verses again. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, we'll stop right there for a minute, and let's talk about this righteousness of God that has been manifested. Sometimes people get a little bit confused as soon as they hear the phrase righteousness of God, and they think that this is talking about the righteousness of God that is a part of his nature. It's not what Paul's talking about. Now, certainly, we can never dismiss that as a part of the whole context. Our God is absolutely righteous. That is, he measures up to the perfect standard and norm of what is right. And that is his own nature revealed as it is in scripture. But because God is righteous, he has to do something about sin. And the righteousness of God that is mentioned in our text here that has been manifested is God's right way of dealing with our sin. It's his right way of providing forgiveness for us so that we will not have to be lost in eternity in hell. And you'll notice that that comes through in the text because he contrasts the righteousness of God that's been manifested. He says it's apart from law. That is law as a way of salvation. 
See, if you want to be saved by law keeping, guess what you got to do? You got to be perfect from the day of your birth to the day of your death. And as we're going to find out in just a moment, Paul says that all have sin and all means all. That means everybody. So we've already missed out on that. There's no way for us to be saved by law keeping. And so God has enacted a plan, a right way based on his righteousness and the righteousness of Christ that we might be able to be forgiven of our sin. And he has made this right way manifest. He's made it known to you and to me and to the world through the word of God. Now, this righteousness of God, of course, comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Now, this is talking only about faith here, but we certainly understand that repentance, confession, and baptism are involved in that response to the gospel. So the righteousness of God, It's been made manifest. Secondly, I want you to notice the reason why. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The little illustration about bow hunting and trying to hit that bullseye. The word sin here is a word that literally means to miss the mark. Now, the mark that's being missed in our text is the glory of God. That is, all of God in his glorious perfection. All of his great majesty and his excellence It's the glory of God. Now that word in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, is used in a couple of different ways. One of the ways that the word glory is used, and the way it was sometimes used by the ancients, is that they would define that word as who someone is and what they are like. And so if Chris and I spend time together, if we were living back in the days of Jesus and the apostles, we spent time and we got to know one another, we would say that glory has passed between us. The reason why we would say that and use that language is because I start to get to know who Chris is and what he's like, and Chris starts to get to know who I am and what I'm like. So we'd say that glory has passed between us. And so when Paul says that all have sinned and that we have fallen short of the glory of God, of who God is and what he is like, he means for us to understand how serious that really is. We have fallen short of God's glorious perfection revealed as it is in Scripture. Now, the very essence of sin, 1 John 3, 4 says that all sin is lawlessness. That's the very essence of sin. And James says in James 2, 10, that if anyone stumbles in just one point of the law, he becomes guilty of all of them. What this does and how serious this is is that it puts us in this problematic relationship with God. And that's, that's kind of a nice way to say it. I mean, that's, that's kind of innocuous there to be able to say it that way. But it puts us in this serious problematic relationship with our great lawgiver and judge, God himself. And it is a serious spiritual problem. Our sin separates us from God. Our sin makes us an enemy of God. And it causes us to be lost because we stand as guilty in the very sight of God. So sin is a serious thing. It is the biggest problem that mankind has. It trumps everything else. Because of our sin, we are lost in the sight of God and we are guilty. But God's provision. I want you to notice what Paul says next in verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now the word righteousness in uh, verse uh, 21 and 22, and the word justified in verse 24 are from the same word family in the Greek language. The word justified is really a wonderful word and it is a legal word. And the word basically means this. It means to declare to be righteous by acquittal. Now here's the thing. When we are justified, when we've come to Christ, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, when we are justified, God declares us to be righteous, to be square with the law by acquitting us of our sin and its guilt. Isn't that good news? Now he does not do that because we're innocent. He does it in spite of the fact that we're 100% guilty 
And the reason why he can do that, as we'll find out in just a moment, is because we've been redeemed by Jesus, the one who was a propitiation for our sin. Isn't that good news? I mean, that's, that's the gospel right there. You and I in Christ can be declared righteous by God. We can be forgiven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. And that's why Paul says it the way that he does, being justified as a gift by his grace. Ah, oh, that wonderful grace of Jesus. That divine favor, that undeserved favor, that as Jack Cottrell would say, that the opposite of what we deserve favor. That's what grace is all about. And it's only found in Jesus because of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. The fact that Jesus went in our stead, the fact that he paid the penalty that the law required for lawbreakers. And he did that on our behalf. So we can be declared righteous. Now there is, sometimes you'll hear people say this, and it's okay that they say this, but they define justification, again, as being just as though we've never sinned. It's really not accurate. We're not being made just as though we've never sinned. We're being forgiven even though we have absolutely sinned against God. And it's because Jesus has paid our penalty in full. Now notice here in this verse uh, 24, Paul talks about the redemption that is in Christ. And that's a part of this. It's what makes justification possible. And it's a synonym, a synonym for forgiveness. And redemption is basically the concept of releasing someone on the receipt of a ransom. In ancient times, we don't use redemption words very much outside of a church context very much today. I don't know how many of the, I don't want to call you old timers, how many of the wisdom year people here Remember redemption stamps. You guys remember those? Yeah, some of us do. I actually remember that as a very small child. My mom had them. They were green colored. They were on a sheet. And we would go to the grocery store. Mom would pull out these redemption stamps, she called them. And we would be able to purchase some of our groceries with those. Well, we don't use that kind of language very much anymore, except maybe in a church setting. But in the ancient times, the concept of redemption and the images of redemption just permeated the society that the Apostle Paul and the other apostles and Jesus himself lived in. And what happened was, because Rome was in power at that time, there were a lot of people who had been enslaved. And what would uh, take place is you could go to the marketplace in a town large enough to have one, and you could find a slave that was on the selling block, so to speak. And if you had the proper money, the proper ransom, you could purchase them. That was what took place in that time period. It was the process of redemption. Now, the problem was that normally when that happened, a slave was purchased by a master, sold by that master, but then purchased by another master. They were still a slave. They didn't get out of slavery. Sometimes they were able to purchase their own freedom, but that was rare. And I want you to understand today that when Jesus redeemed us so that we could be justified, we're still slaves. But now we're slaves of somebody who loves us and wants what's best for us. He redeemed us and the ransom price was his blood on the cross of Calvary. Again, good news. Romans 9, 12 says that he did not enter by the means of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, that is the presence of God, with his own blood to obtain eternal redemption for us. The price for our release, for our forgiveness, had to be paid to God. Our sin is against him. We're guilty in his sight because of sin. And Jesus paid the price so that we could be Free, Not free in the sense of to do whatever we want, but free to serve a master who loves us, who wants what's best for us, and has gone to prepare a place for us someday for eternity. And that brings us to verse 25. And this may be, again, my opinion, one of the most important verses in all of the Bible that describes to us what Jesus did on the cross. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Now we'll stop right there and talk about this fancy highfalutin 
church word, propitiation. Let me just cut right to it. The word means an offering that satisfies or turns away wrath. That's what propitiation is. And here's what Jesus did. And I, I don't know, I know we, we appreciate this as Christians, but I don't know that we can fully appreciate this. Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and he experienced the eternal wrath of God at sin in our place. Dr. Roger Chambers once said, the wrath of God catches every man. It either catches you at the cross or catches you at judgment, but catch you at will. And he's right. You have to deal with the wrath of God. You either deal with it at the cross where Jesus took it on himself, or you'll have to deal with it in eternity in hell. We're the ones who choose that. Remember, the provision of salvation is universally available, but it's only personally applied. Jesus died for everybody, but we still have to come to him. And he died this propitiatory death where he accepted the wrath of God upon himself in our stead. He experienced hell for us so that we don't have to. And now when we stand before him someday, guess what? We're free, free to go into eternity with him in heaven. Why? Because he experienced the very wrath of God. Now, I want you to notice something that's so important here. I mentioned just a moment ago that Jesus shed his blood and he offered that ransom price to God. I want you to notice here that it says that God set him forth publicly as a propitiation. Heard somebody ask the question one time, Who's responsible for the death of Jesus? I heard answers. Judas, he had to play a part in that. Yeah, he did. The Roman soldiers, they certainly played a part in that. It was Roman nails or Roman hammer. The Jews, they certainly had something to do with that because they were the ones who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. The religious leaders of the Jews in particular. Ah, oh, but this fellow said, no, 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 no. He said, we're the ones who crucified Jesus. That's not true. We crucified him only indirectly in that he died for our sins. God sent him forth publicly as a propitiation. It was God's plan and God's man who went to the cross. It was his idea. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You get that? It was God's plan. God sent him to the cross. Our sins against God. And he sent him to the cross and then poured out his wrath on him that we might be saved. Wow. I tell you, if that doesn't make you, if you're not a Christian tonight, if that doesn't want to make you in just a moment at the invitation, run up this aisle, I don't know what will. Jesus is the propitiation with his blood for us. Now, why did God do all this? There's a lot in this last couple of verses. It says this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he had passed over or had not poured out his wrath and punished uh, the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The word just in verse 26 is the third of those words in the righteousness family group of words in this text. And I want you to understand here that the reason why God did all that he did by sending Jesus to the cross was so that he could be just. Some people believe that God is just because he forgives us of our sins. That is not what makes God just. God is just because of the way he provides for the forgiveness of our sins. God has to punish sin. And he punished Jesus instead of me. And he punished Jesus instead of you. And that makes God just. You see, God's wrath has to be satisfied at sin. But because he's a loving God, he is willing to go to the greatest lengths imaginable to make that happen. It's exactly what he did. He sent Jesus 
to come here to die on the cross of, the Cal uh, of Calvary that you and I might have the opportunity of salvation. That is such good news. It's good news to embrace. It's good news to respond to. And it is good news to share. I'm telling you tonight, I am going to heaven because Jesus has already paid the penalty for me. It's not because of any righteous things I've done. It's not because I'm anybody. But it's because he loved me and I'm valuable in his sight, just like you are. Jesus died for you and he died for me that we might be saved. So, this, in my opinion, the single greatest paragraph in all the Bible. My favorite one. And it tells us about the provision of God. A provision for you, a provision for me. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. We're going to have a time of invitation tonight. If you have a decision that you need to make, if you have not yet confessed your faith in Christ, repented of your sins and been immersed into Christ so that you can receive the benefit of forgiveness of sins, justification, redemption, so that you don't have to experience the wrath of God for eternity. We invite you to come tonight as Dave and Chris come up and lead us in our invitation hymn. Come as together we stand at this time. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind. in a way that you understand it better. And for those of you that are Christians, that you take what you've heard and go do something with it and teach others about that saving grace that only God provides. And for those of you that aren't sure about your salvation and where you are in Christ, we want to help you with that. And I would encourage you to come see myself or Paul. And there are dozens of people here tonight that would love to study with you and help you see what the Bible says as it relates to your soul. And uh, so we're so grateful for Paul and that message tonight, and Chris and the music. So thankful for both of these guys. Chris has a table in the foyer, and I would encourage you tonight or sometime this week to stop by there. He has CDs, even a Christmas CD. I know some of you are ready for Christmas already. And uh, so Chris would be happy to share in, in, uh, in his ministry with you through music uh, at home, uh, some T-shirts and other ways that you can take the message that he shared with you out this week. And um, Paul will be teaching every day, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at two o'clock here at the building. So any of you men that do any preaching or are interested in preaching, Sunday school classes, communion meditations, he's going he's gonna to help us improve our preaching. I got a message from a buddy of mine who said, I'm going to be there this week to help you improve your preaching. And I thought, well, that, that's pretty rude. And then it, it clicked. It was Paul's class he was coming for. Not just to improve my preaching, but his preaching too. And so I hope that uh, you'll be back every night this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And in the afternoons at 2 o'clock for the guys. And if you have any questions or any needs, we're here for you. Let me close in prayer, and then we'll have a closing chorus. Our God in heaven, we give you thanks. What a good night we have shared together. Encouragement in song and certainly encouragement in the word. Father, we pray 
that our hearts and our minds will more deeply understand what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ, that our hearts will be convicted to do something with that information and that our lives will be transformed because of it. And Father, we just pray that in the course of the next few days that we will take what we've heard here, apply it in our own lives and share it with others who need to hear it. Father, we give you thanks for tonight. Look forward to being back tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of